Hi there, welcome back to part three of this installment of Let's Make a Drug. Specifically, we're looking at how to make a cannabinoid type 2 receptor agonist. In summary, what we've done so far is we have made a homology model of the um, cannabinoid type 2 receptor from a crystal structure. So it, it's very accurate doing it this way. It's no different than the actual crystal structure. We sort of cleaned up the crystal structure. It's actually now ready to for us to dock a bunch of ligands into it, probably a million, maybe two million, maybe 10 million. We could do a lot with this. Um, what I want to talk about today are some interesting stipulations. So let's get to it. Let's zoom in on the active site. If you press L for ligand, we're going to change the style to Vanderwall. The reason we're going to do that is in my perception, in my very biased area of drug discovery, um, drugs or ligands form complex three-dimensional shapes. And you can see that this um, Win55212 compound, this is a three-dimensional shape that it forms. And because it forms this three-dimensional shape when it fits inside the receptor, it holds the CB2 receptor in this conformation, which holds it in an agonist-bound state to activate it. What we want to do is use this screening method where we screen millions and millions of compounds, and we'll find that at the end, we're going to develop a drug that has a somewhat similar shape three-dimensionally to this one. And that's kind of how we're going to build a, another CB2 agonist, a drug that three-dimensionally has a similar shape to this one. There's another way you can think about this. Click ligands, do that, go to uh, select, more objects, go to, uh, I'm looking for binding sites. What this does is it highlights the amino acid residues that are in the active site interacting with our drug or ligand. There's a few things we can notice here. There is a bat, there's a hydrogen bond with this serine residue right here. This hydrogen bond with the serine residue is actually quite common in CB1 and CB2. If you want to measure how many angstroms an interaction is, you can do the following. We actually need to put the hydrogen on here to do that though. Let's put the hydrogen on here. Go to style. Okay, so first you have to select the amino acid, then go to style, go here and go to show all hydrogens. That's really the interaction that we're looking at, this hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonding to the carbonyl oxygen. If you go to um, measure and click the two distances between the atoms here and here, uh, we're looking at 2.27 angstroms. Hydrogen bonds can occur anywhere from about 1.8 to 2.2, 2.3 angstroms. Um, interactions don't have to be these very defined discrete values. They can have a little bit of variability within them. Uh, I'm just going to go to edit, undo, measure. So what we were looking at before is we selected the, uh, let's go to select. more objects, binding site. Another way to think about this is that these are all the interacting amino acid residues in the binding pocket, okay? To see that a little bit more clear, you can go to ligand interaction. That'll pop up a display box for us, which makes it a bit easier to see. That'll pop up this. You can rotate this any way you like. And sort of the stipulations we wanna think about are that our new CB2 high affinity agonist ligand, whatever you want to call it, um, is probably going to also have this hydrogen bond with serine uh, 285 because it appears in CB1 and CB2. Other than that, there's not many stipulations of things that we generally want in a compound. Some of the other important interactions that we probably will come up with when we uh, run this large scale screening is so like serines 
Um, functional uh, amino acids with alcohols can generally form hydrogen bonds. The other important ones to think about are aromatic amino acids like phenylalanine, uh, tyrosine, um, tryptophan would be the other one. These are important because they can form uh, aromatic interactions, so pi-pi stacking interactions, either being like a face-to-face -face pi stack or a T-shaped pi stack interaction. The other cool thing you can do with aromatic amino acids is you can do a cation pi interaction, but you need like a positively charged amine group for that. And I'm probably going to select uh, out, I don't really want to do any positively charged um, molecules on our drug screen, only because it makes our library much larger. We're probably going to use neutral molecules in the, in the library when we actually get to it. For example, positively charged amines are not important in uh, CB1 or CB2 receptor. But if we looked at a serotonin 2A crystal structure, they're super important. So this is the 5-HT2A crystal structure. This was published by Brian Roth's research group in, I think, like November or December of 2020, I want to say. Yeah, this came out about a year ago, this crystal structure. Because I remember being super excited about it. thought it was super cool. Okay, so what I'm talking about is this amino acid right here. Okay, let's go to residues. This is aspartic acid, right? Aspartic acid uh, is at physiological pH, uh, has a resonating negative charge on one of the oxygens. And that negative charge on oxygen can interact with a positively char charged amine group forming a salt bridge, which is shown in purple. And it, a lot of research has shown that if you mutate this residue, uh, the activity of 5-HT2A, 2B, and 2C ligands get absolutely destroyed. They get wrecked. So this is really important when you're trying to make um, diff uh, psychedelics and generally compounds that bind to the serotonin 2A, 2B, or 2C um, receptors. But for cannabinoid type 1 and type 2 receptor, this is not important at all. So kind of the idea that we get from today's lecture, so to, so to speak, are that we want to, one, is that we want to make a, sorry, okay, uh, the first thing is basically we talked about is that in today is that we want to make a compound that has a somewhat similar three-dimensional structure as this uh, compound bound to the orthosteric binding site, which is WIN55212, because we want to hope, be able to hold the receptor or force it into a similar conformation as this compound does. And that's kind of how we're going to do this project. You begin to, as you, uh, I don't know, study one area, become really fixated, really specialized, which is kind of what I do now, is think about these things as like, I think about a lot of these things as simple, like a baseball and a baseball glove, where my drug is my baseball and my receptor is my baseball glove and the pocket is like the active site and you you know you can you can fit all these different types of shapes into a baseball glove but there are some shapes that are going to fit better in a baseball glove than other shapes but making it very complicated our drug receptor complex is a very complicated baseball and it's a very complicated baseball glove because the shapes are very bizarre as you can see in here, none of these, this isn't like your normal square, oval type shape. It's a protein sort of globular shape. And I feel like I just ranted a little bit there about this kind of stuff. But uh, next time we'll actually look at how to um, import drugs from the zinc database into our workspace and kind of begin this ultra large scale screening method, which um, is something I'm a huge fan of. Till then, hope you guys uh, learned, enjoyed the lecture, and bye.